everybody. I hope you are all doing well. Uh, today, uh, we are going to be discussing uh, an exciting new movie uh, called Dune, which I'm sure many of you have seen. It is the story of a Western man, apparently, who goes to the desert, takes a load of drugs to discover himself. And, of course, who better to discuss that issue with me than... Stefan Bertram Lee. And of course, uh, to assist as our kind of expert witness uh, is science fiction writer and king of being cancelled, <laughs> Doug Lane. So yeah, uh, I kind of wanted to bring people together to discuss Dune as a movie because it's a cultural phenomenon uh this is a highly anticipated movie and compared to the kind of science fiction dross that we've been getting lately you know like this endless marvel movies and things like that dune at least has pretensions to being sort of a higher level of art uh, the books of course have been extremely influential on science fiction you know, as a Warhammer fan, basically the entire Warhammer 40,000 universe is basically June uh, with a little bit of foundation and, I don't know, like Mooncrock all like mixed into one. But, you know, June is, is really one of the foundational sort of modern science fiction uh, works. Uh, it's controversial. Its publication history was, you know, quite difficult at the beginning. But it built this huge cult following and influenced, you know, everything from, you know, Star Wars to, you know, any kind of sort of soup, you know, galactic civilization style uh, um, science fiction space opera. So, yeah, I wanted to bring, of course, Stefan, who, you know, obviously is our very own Paul Atreides, given his experience uh, traveling from, you know, the wet, rainy island of Britain all the way to the scorching deserts of Rojava. And then, of course, Doug, who is actually, which people may not know this, but I'm sure they do, uh, is a, a an accomplished science fiction writer. Um, you know, he knows the industry, knows about science fiction, but not a Dune fan. Am I correct in that? Yeah, I'm not. I mean, I, it's not like I hate the, the book. I haven't read the book. And I, I did watch the original movie, and I've seen the new new version. Um, and I, I'm not really a fan of either either property. But, but it was so I big. Well, yeah, you know. Okay, I, I'm going to tell a brief story about when I saw it originally in 19. What was it? 1983, 1984. 1984. That was yeah. the David Lynch version in 1984. Yeah. Which so, is. Which I went on my birthday in 1984 <laughs> to see Dune. I How was, old were you? Was that like when you were like 40? 26. I, 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 both of you guys can go and fuck yourselves. No, I was 13. <laughs> <laughs> I was 13 years old in 1984. And I had received that day uh, a Walkman for my oh. birthday. Yeah, the tape and the radio. It was really cool. And I went in to the theater. I was fiddling with my Walkman before I got in to the theater. And then I started watching the movie. And about, I don't know, 30 40 minutes into the movie i decided it would be more fun to listen to the radio on my walkman than to watch this movie anymore so i i, so, I listened to my was like the first boomer looking at his phone in the movie theater <laughs> that's right yeah he's um, doing it way way before anyone else yeah yeah well, you know, doug is very like avant-garde so yeah i'm always ahead of the curve in all the dysfunctions uh, that, that my <laughs> Well, let's let's start by talking. Uh, let's start about talk, talking about the movie, since you know that's where most people are coming to Dune from. Uh, we have, of course, we, it's not just the. I don't know if you guys have all seen it, but I don't think you've seen the David Lynch movie from 1984. Uh, that was like a critical disaster, I think, at the time. It was, you know, it looked very good, but uh, it was extremely poorly paced. I mean, I like it for a whole host host of reasons, but it isn't really Dune. It's not from really what like, I from what I heard, it doesn't have any of the stuff where like that indicates that Paul being the prophet is kind of a plot or like a conspiracy. Yeah, Rather than you just kind of take it from the Freven perspective as if he's really the guy. Yes. 
Exactly. So it kind of misses the entire point which of the novel, which we'll get to in a bit. Yes, but uh, it's poorly paced. It kind of misses. It's almost an inversion of what the Dune story is supposed to be. Uh, and then you have the mini series from the Sci-Fi Channel in the uh, early 2000s, which was a little bit more faithful to the to, to the book. They did the Dune uh, first novel. Then they did uh, they they kind of combined Messiah. And Children of Dune together to make a next part uh, of the mini series, which was, you know, the the special effects weren't as good, um, but you know they did their best with what with a limited budget, and it was it was watchable, it was enjoyable. I remember my friend um, my my friend told me uh, that Dune TV series was where he learned the meaning of the word cuckold, so he was very pleased about that. <laughs> so because of the count, huh? So the count friendly got every spelled. Oh no 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 no! There is actually uh, uh, it's because Duncan Idaho is getting cuckolded by Alia oh. in the second novel, but you know it's a, a whole different uh, a whole different story. But let's talk about this new highly anticipated movie. Um, you know people were going nuts from it. Uh, I think they made the right decision, in my opinion, to divide the story up into two parts instead of trying to rush everything into one movie. And even in the first part, and Stefan, you've read the book, there are some major bits that they've cut out, which I have a theory that they filmed, but they cut out for the cinematic version. But uh, yeah, I would like to get you know Stefan's thoughts on the movie, what you think about it, and then Doug, why you didn't like it. So I, I read the book like when I was a teen, but. I realized, unlike most of the books I read, I, I just had, I couldn't remember a single thing that happened, apart from in the end, everything got fucked up, which obviously it did, of the, like, the first half. Um, but maybe it was just because I hadn't seen, like, a good movie in the cinema for, like, a few years because of COVID and whatever, and I never went to cinema very much anyway. But I was shell-shocked. My mind was blown. It was incredible. In terms of, like, set design and costume design, it's like the best movie I've ever seen. Um, the actors were very impressive. And I guess the script was very impressive too. Like everyone, it was very not soy, as they say. Everyone had very like heroic emotions. Like everyone mm. felt bad and felt good in kind of a very heroic thing. Like when at the start, near the start where um, the housekeeper is meeting the mother, and in the moment of prophecy, she like cries out in agony. I think in most films, they would kind of cut that bit because on the screen, it's a bit weird. But I think leaving it in was, was really great. And there was several of these moments during the film. What about, what about your thoughts, Doug? Well, um, I went in uh, thinking about the Blade Runner 2049, expecting it to be maybe similar and in some ways i guess it was it was it was simpler and less broken than blade runner 2049 you know but uh both of them were great visual spectacles although i think i like blade runner better because it was more uh interesting this was a very beige movie you know i uh, uh you know I've, I've got old eyes so maybe i didn't catch the details but it just seemed very monochromatic and beige and and um <clears throat> you know and the characters were all heroic but they were also uh you know i i never found myself really that invested in them because i couldn't find a way into a, the only one you could possibly identify with was paul i suppose um and he was so clearly uh i don't know overpowered and and um and his course was so obviously set. I mean, I never for a moment worried about him arriving at wherever he was supposed to get. You know, that that seemed uh, like that. W he had what's called plot armor on that was uh, thick enough to, if, if someone had dropped a nuclear bomb on him, I knew he would survive. You know, there's, there's nothing, uh, there's not a lot of uh, that danger or suspense, suspense around him um and i just didn't find the the motivations uh particularly you know compelling for me but that the other thing is like again every every movie you watch you watch it at a certain point in your life right and i watched this movie on a date uh <laughs> with someone i had matched with on an app um 
and who I'd gone on dates with a few times. But it was, I also knew that going in that she had expectations that I would like this movie. She was excited <laughs> about it. <laughs> um, there's and, a whole psychodrama. Uh, yeah, there's a whole, there, lots of things were going on in my life at that moment. And focusing on the movie was not movie, easy. Right, <clears throat> right. So, so like, you know, I had to find, I got there a little bit later than she did. I had to find her in the dark. Everyone's wearing masks. I had, I, I settled in across the aisle from her not knowing that that's what I had done. Just thinking I'm, I'll start texting her to find her. And then she just turns and says, hi. And I, so anyway, it was like a weird, everything was weird. Uh, <laughs> um uh and so yeah my experience of the movie was probably not optimal but uh there that's what i'll say I, about dune i saw it with like eight friends no okay see much better much better only one of them was looking at his phone <laughs> one oh, of them really? was looking at his, on his phone during the movie yeah, yeah but you can't just... you can't avoid that people you know especially what you're are you a, a zoomer or a millennial stefan i'm a millennial but okay. he claims he's a millennial but he's basically he's 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 an effective zoomer. He's like for me, we've we've all we've discussed this off camera with uh, Jason and Pascal that like whatever Stefan says, he's our zoomer. He's like our so, connection to the zoomer. Well, I I have you know he's the zoomer. Zoom I have four zoomers uh, on call in the wings at any time. If you guys want to bring on some zoomers, they're all my kids. So, but um, uh, yeah. So my oldest is twenty. Five, just coming up on being 25 and he is on the cusp born 1996 in between millennial and zoomer yeah, so I'm you must be you're 26 so right all right so you are uh, just the last of the millennials last yeah <laughs> but, yeah obviously jen's right that like effectively you know i've got like uh, internet acquired adhd or whatever mm -hmm. so really yeah. have that kind of uh, zoomer taste right yeah i mean you're you're basically the same age as my oldest kid, so yeah, you're a Zoomer. Yeah, were your parents uh, boomers or Gen Xers? Uh, also cusp. My mom was born 1964, so. Mm, right, right, right. So cusp, mm -hmm. cusp, the cusp. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, um, that's the personal background demographics, and <laughs> I guess we can move on. You know, before we started recording, you were talking about the book and. Um, I was enjoying my moment of eld, you know, correcting you as an elder about Joseph Campbell and John Campbell, because yeah, you yeah. said Joseph Campbell didn't want to publish Dune, but it was John Campbell who was a, a big science fiction editor in the in the golden age of science fiction, um, and uh, I, I would like to know why John W. Campbell didn't want Dune or what what had gone on. What well, was the story there? My, the reasons for my confusion weren't just the name, but because the apparent reason for the refusal was because John Campbell was into this very traditionalist kind of idea of the hero. And he said in the second book, um, I keep wanting to call him Herbert June, as if June's his surname. <laughs> uh, <laughs> as if the author, he thought the author had created an anti-hero in the second book, uh, mm -hmm. not like a traditional heroic figure. And this was the reason for the rejection. Um, and it's obviously an interesting thing to think about with the film. Because one of the things they cut out of the film uh, was kind of the whole plot where the spy master mm -hmm. suspects the mother of being the traitor. Um, mm -hmm. And then he turns to the Harkonnens. And you wonder if that whole thing is just going to be cut out because then he's pretty essential to that. Like all the cuts they made, it all makes sense and makes the first film fine. But then if you wonder in the second film how they're going to kind of bring things back or if they're going to just diverge and do something else. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a really good point. Like, uh, I mean, my theory is that. So, in in terms of in terms of the original Dune, which I think Dune was originally serialized, it wasn't published as a book and, and initially. The, no, all the, of the first like third of it was serialized in John yeah, Campbell. Yeah. So, so it's it was basically a uh, you know you have several plot threads. We got like, we got the main plot thread, which is about uh, Paul Atreides and his discovery. And what they do well in the movie compared to the 1984 movie is dropping hints that his messiahdom, which is being prophesized, is actually a fabricated uh, conspiracy. 
and there's hints dropped uh, in it that if you've read the book you'll pick up on them but if you haven't you might not you might not notice them straight away well, I mean, they, they say explicitly when they arrive to arrakis the spy master guy says the bene Gesserit has prepared for our arrival which i guess yeah. you don't know exactly what that is but if you've read the books you're like oh oh that's a but uh the subplot like you point out there's a whole subplot where you actually get to know the household of uh paul atreides you get to know his father i mean i think you know the leto atreides was a good character i just think he needed more screen time to develop because he had that kind of doomed hero uh, perspective but as soon as they arrived on arrakis it's kind of like he's doomed right and he knows he's doomed whereas in the novel there's like a bit of time where they have a feast there's the whole spy plot uh there's kind they have a little rest before things go wrong which kind of heightens you know heightens the tragedy whereas yeah, like that's my like main and only real problem with the movie that kind of the bit where they arrive to the planet and they're waiting to get betrayed feels like it takes like a day and a night of like right. in universe time it's like they arrive there's like a drama with them getting sabotaged but then that instantly becomes totally irrelevant because then because the Harkonnens basically just sabotage themselves in the end because they it seemed like they only didn't have control of the planet for about 36 hours you know yeah exactly it's it it, it, it did not that it's supposed to be it, it's supposed to be like I think a matter of months I can't I can't remember in the book but there's an extended period of time they have time to so there's like the tempo of that kind of betrayal is not built up enough uh in the book and I think from the movie's perspective, it made sense to cut that out because that would have been maybe another hour worth of uh, movie you'd have to put in there to do that bit justice. But as you point out, that's going to have repercussions down the way because, you know, you have the Mantak character, who uh, Thufa Howard, who doesn't get that much development. But I wasn't even sure if he'd lived in, in the film. I was confused. Well, we don't know what happens to him in the film, but like we all in the books, spoilers that you know he ends up being uh put in service because he replaces Peter de Vries who again is the mentat who works for the Harkonnens but we don't get much development of him either we, I don't he's, think he's even named he just appears on screen he just appears on screen so I think um you know again understandable uh for trying to make a movie but it's it, it kind of I mean that's why I think Dune should have been made as a miniseries and not as a movie but, but it's funny that it was still it's really long obviously but it was eight minutes shorter than james bond i think it really could have used those eight minutes yeah eight minutes shorter than, than 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 what than james bond is that what you said james bond that just came out which is ridiculously long and melodramatic that's like a whole bond film within a bond film i still liked it anyway but well um i want to go back to john campbell some something i i'm that you know i had something to say about before we started recording but we'll see if it can get it shoehorned in here in a relevant way um campbell when he would commission works from people like isaac asimov would come to them with their with an idea completely formed like he would write down a sketch and say write this book write this short story um and by the way that would be if i were to be in publishing again i'd love to be able to do that have a stable of writers and i'd just tell them here this is what you write um and i think it would work no i think i'm going to do it um not for every writer but you know but his vision was very much like a pulp melodramatic uh progressive science vision i mean there when i say progressive i don't mean politically progressive or enlightened apparently he had terrible views around race um but the uh the the point was he really believed in that technology would liberate humanity and he wanted to have stories that reflected uh that were basically propaganda for scientific development um and that's definitely not what Dune is right <clears throat> right so um it would make sense to me that uh that Campbell would not love Dune and it, it's precisely for the reasons that you said and beyond that but do you think Dune really is a science fiction at all? Does this it is technological and scientific development a major part of Dune, or could this be taking place a hundred years ago without science fiction trappings and still be the basically the same story? I have it in my notes later when we're talking about the universe, but I think for to focus on the film, 
I think definitely the technological bit gets a bit underdeveloped because I think the main technological theme of the books is kind of the Fremen technology with how they're like through insane kind of like dedication they're planning to terraform the whole planet and they have these still suits which can protect them in these insane environments and so on and so on while kind of the noble houses they, yeah they're just doing kind of neo-feudalism they're using kind of sci fi te technology to make themselves better than the peasantry in a like actual concrete real way in a way that our nobility wasn't because you know it was fake but they, they managed to use technology to and also kind of this weird 60s idea of kind of like mental techniques and stuff mm -hmm. um to to really make themselves qualitatively better than than most people so i think it's yeah i think it's a very kind of um the, the degree to which there's technology on the how on the side of the nobility which is the side which is shown in the film it's reactionary and the progressive technology is definitely there in the books but it's from the fremen and then you don't really see that you see it visually but it's not really described to you uh in the film yeah i i think i think it isn't just a it isn't just a a, a drama like a, a an aristocratic drama with sci-fi trappings i do think there is an important it, it is trying to say some things you know the background to the dune universe and perhaps this is a good point to pivot to discussing the universe is that you know frank herbert you know makes the argument that you know people become become dependent on computers and technology and they have to throw those things off to to progress but you know uh, and, and that forces humans to evolve a whole set of as stefan points out mental conditioning techniques use of drugs uh, use of the spice melange which again you know is a metaphor for i guess oil but or and like it's it's basically oil and lsd in one product yeah, yeah. that's 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 what the spice melange. so i think it is a science fish i think it's it is science fiction but it, it's kind of it's it's like it's it's basically kind of like the foundation but if asimov took a bunch of acid before writing the foundation and then and wrote like actually you know this scientific uh utopia stuff it's not all you know there's this technological skepticism there it's not a complete rejection of technology but there is a kind of there is a kind of skeptical uh aspect to it which could be read as quite reactionary but could also be read in a progressive way saying that hey technology isn't going to liberate you you know uh it's about who controls the technology because you know another part of the dune universe background is you have these noble houses and you have a monopoly chome which is this big monopoly trading corporation and everything is run it's, in it's a, very guild right yeah it's, it's not it's, like, it's not capitalist it's guild like right guild yeah you have like guilds uh, and this kind of stifling political uh, uh and economic uh, situation uh which is kind of being critiqued by by herbert which you know it's it's obviously he has in his mind the 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 growth of the managerial state in the uh, in the new deal era and and seeing this as becoming like a neo-feudalism and a neo sort of um yeah like as a, a neo-feudalistic system which becomes stagnant because you know stagnation is one of the key themes of uh of dune as it is to a certain degree in uh, the foundation it's just yeah. herbert takes it in a different direction yeah i mean in the in the books like the fremen are kind of ridiculously good at fighting and otherwise like they can basically like outshine the nobility totally even though they're com they're like they, it's not that they reject technology it's that the kind of the nobility are using this technology to make their lives like soft and easy while the Fremen are using their technology within the incredibly harsh environment to make their lives just about livable, you know? And that kind of makes them hard and effective and makes the nobility a lot less. Yeah, the nobility is soft and it, and it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's very much like, uh, you know, obviously the themes that Herbert is drawing on and a lot of the vocabulary is from Middle Eastern history. And there's, you know, definitely allusions to the, rise of islam but he has a kind of uh uh 
Khaldunian notion of historical change. So the Ibn Khaldun was a uh, Islamic scholar who saw uh, societal change as being driven by a conflict between people in the peripheries who had, you know, who were strong tough, and shaped by the conditions of those peripheries, who would come and conquer a uh, settled civilization where people are basically sheeple. And, uh, and then they would in turn be seduced by that uh, urban civilization and that luxury and that decadence and eventually overthrown. And there's very much that cycle, yeah. that, that kind of that understanding of like a sociological cycle between, you know, the, 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 the periphery, which is, you know, which is forged in these harsh conditions and then urban civilization, which tends towards bureaucracy and decadence. And, and, and like the, the proposal of Howard, the Mentat guy, is basically to kind of directly to weaponize that, to use that, to keep Arrakis as kind of this place, this cycle of, of hardening people, mm -hmm. but able to like pick people out from that and send them out into this decadent empire, but to constantly have this group that's kind of half inside, half out. Which is uh, which is actually how the emperor maintains control because the whole story behind the Saduka, which are the like elite imperial army, is that they live on this prison planet and they're like cultivated in this harsh condition to be violent. And the only people who can defeat them are the, the Fremen, who are in even are, are in an even harsher uh, thing. But you know, the, the... so what what is the political economy of of Dune? I mean. It's spice. Spice is only on this one planet, right? And it's something that everyone in the universe needs for interstellar travel. Yeah. And it cannot be synthesized. It cannot be. Yeah. You can't create artificial spice. And how much spice is uh, is there supposed to be? Is it going to run out? It's a. Um, well, it's obscured a bit, but it's uh, produced by like the biological processes of these worms. Oh so right. It's a okay. renewable resource, but only if you keep this. Up environment why, why don't why don't they grab some of these worms and 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 put them on like a bunch of they different try. Planets? well well actually as you get later on in the books and this is a spoiler later on in the books uh they do find a way to create spice uh like through other means and then they do also manage to relocate some worms to other planets but but in the first couple of normals like all attempts to move worms to other planets have failed. They can't synthesize it. They've got like an insane life cycle, haven't they? Yeah. And all uh, and the worms look for a long, long time. Is that what well, you're saying? They have this, like they have these little worms and then sand trouts and then they. Yeah. They go through like, a, like butterflies to caterpillars, but there's like four stages before you actually get work. And the, the, the basically spice is critical to guild navigation travel and if i remember correctly in the first novel at the very least it's not widely known that the guild navigators require the spice in order to do their like space travel because spice helps you see the future which allows you to like fly and not fly into a planet and i think mm -hmm. if i remember correctly in the first novel that's actually a secret people don't know it because the main use of spice is to extend people's lives Right, uh, they call it the geriatric spice because it allows humans to live like three times, three times their length, and that's the co that's that's also why it's extremely, uh, uh, you know. Um, so, but what, what? How does it do it? Just like you, um, you'll take the, you won't get hit by cars or something like that if you are on spice or you get well, you, you get you, well maybe you get you take a bunch of spice apparently and and uh, you you it prolongs your natural life. Okay. But also, if you're sensitive in the right way and you have the right kind of mental training, it will make you prescient. Yeah. So the, the answer is kind of yes. Also, it will stop you getting hit by cars. Yes. <laughs> and also, also, if you get addicted to it, you can't fucking stop. Otherwise, you die. So it's suit. Like, and the whole aristocracy is addicted to spice, right? Because they're all wanting to live long. So you have a ruling class that is addicted to this substance that is only available on one planet, right? Mm -hmm. And it is the key ingredient of like, it's the, it's the, it's the, the key resource of that civilization. It's the, 
It's the foundational resource of that civilization. Mm -hmm. And then you have this feudal economic system, you know, where, where different planets, you know, do light industry, agriculture, you know, that kind of stuff. And there's a big monopoly company that controls that and everybody has shares, all the aristocracy has shares in that. Then as Stefan says, you have guilds and then you have some like, you have planets like the X who are there on the periphery and they're allowed to do like machines. They're, a little, they're like a machine civilization and yeah. the Telexu who are like a biological civilization that do biotech and uh you so know. let me ask let me ask a question then the, the, um, if i'm remembering the movie correctly the emperor sends uh the royal family uh with paul paul's mom and dad to um to the doom planet to rule it uh and there are there's an indigenous population that lives in the desert and they are their whole goal as is to harvest the spice the, the royal family's goal is to harvest the spice and work with the indigenous people to harvest the spice. But they're sabotaged by the emperor through a, a, some minion of the emperors, the Marlon Brando yeah. uh, clone, um, is sabotaging them. Why? What is the end goal there? Uh, wouldn't that put the spice production in major jeopardy? And wouldn't you want to keep the spice flowing? Why would you want to sabotage the very people you're sending to to take Duke, care of it? Duke, I mean, from the emperor's Duke point of view. Duke Leto is very popular because uh, he's an honorable goodman um, and is kind of threatening the emperor's position. So the emperor allies with like the biggest dickhead in the galaxy to make to and together with their strength they can hit the duke very hard and basically knock him out and the disruption to the spice supply won't be very long and this kind of puts the okay it won't be very this. long but it looked like it was you know in those conditions it would take a long time a long well, long time to rebuild the, the, a key aspect of the book is that the harkonnens and the emperor have been hoarding spice right? oh so they've been hoarding also, spice. also in the book which is cut from the film um he just blows that all up duke atreides yeah some of the spice on suicide mission yeah, so they have uh, so so um, the Harkonnens are like well-known spice hoarders as mm -hmm. well. So this is also an opportunity for them to uh, you know like increase the spice prices as well. There's all you know there's a, so yeah like Stefan laid it out. Leto ha is popular amongst in the Landsrat, which is like the Parliament of uh, of nobles, and also his armed forces are becoming very strong. So he has like the best the best armed forces outside of Sadaka. So, you know, he's seen as this big threat, but he can't be attacked directly. So he needs to be defeated and humiliated. And the only way that they could do this was to like draw him out to Arrakis. That was the only thing that could draw him away from his base of power and take him out of his comfort zone where they could kind of take him out with ease. And of course he kind of knew this was what they were doing. Yeah. Even when he was sent there, right? He yeah. knew it was a trap from the beginning. It seemed to yeah. me uh, it was obvious. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I'm, okay. I'm just I'm just trying to track it. Just it, it seems to me if I was the emperor, if I was in charge of everything. I would simply you know pull this uh, more charismatic uh, guy close to me, you know, embrace him to control him rather than set him up for a failure. And um, I would try to just keep that spice production going as, as best I could. I wouldn't fuck around. Uh, but uh, that's me. Well, if, if, and if, if I, I was, was in, I would I would increase the productivity of the of the galaxy until we reach socialism. Well, that's not get crazy here. I want to remain emperor. I don't I don't want to uh, overcome myself. I, no no no. I I will need to be deposed. I, I will you know need to be killed eventually uh, as emperor. But I'd uh, be more benign to Emperor. Um, all right, I've, I have enough babble for me. You guys so, can actually talk about the movie again rather than just my... Uh, like, I'm thinking <laughs> the universe is... It's very like 1960s CIA. Mm -hmm. In the sense, they have this thing with the drugs, but they also have, they're very obsessed with kind of mental techniques. Like, the, the kind of magical voice, it's not explicated in the uh, movie, but the voice is not meant to be like magic magic it's meant to be something where 
through like kind of deep observation of someone, you can know every feature about them just by kind mm -hmm. of looking at them if you're trained well enough. And then if you know them that well, there's always certain words that will make a certain person do something. And so if you deploy those words, it's meant to just be a completely non-supernatural way of, of convincing them. But only works if you're like 3 million IQ, which apparently is something you can kind of train and breed into people in, in the June universe. So there's that thing of eugenics too. Uh, you yeah, know, I, I want to I go back to John Campbell here and say that the beginnings of science fiction through the Golden Age were all about, you know, developing psychic powers and and uh uh genetic uh uh improvements and and spiritual uh teachings um and and like isaac asimov who was a committed humanist and atheist kind of split from campbell based on the fact that campbell was getting into more and more pseudoscientific crazy ideas around well, the foundation psychics. has psychics in it yeah right i mean um and uh one of the earlier successful novels that came out of astounding which was Campbell, uh, was called Slan. You know, it was all about mutants who had psychic abilities and were persecuted by the normies in the world for their, for being an advanced uh, uh, mutation in, in humanity. Um, and uh, there used to be, for years and years and years, uh, a saying amongst science fiction writers, uh, which it was this, um, fans are slans. That is like the, 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 yeah, the yeah, fan way <laughs> They were all mutants, but but they were and and you know miscreants and mutants, but they were also for that special and yeah. uh, you know uh, uh, smarter than average and all of that kind of thing. Um, I don't know, and you know I have to remember like Dianetics and L. Ron Hubbard that all came out of that same milieu. Yeah. Um, but yeah, but it is it is very, it's not just that you have like these you have su you have these supernatural powers inverted commas which are not supernatural powers, but Along with that, you have all these, like, this discussion of conditioning, for example, right? Uh, mm -hmm. You know, one of the storylines is uh, Dr. U Wellington Ua has is a medical doctor from the Souk School, and they have this special imperial conditioning that means that they can't do any harm. But, like, the subplot is that... Outside of a very obvious kind of circumstance into which your loved one is threatened. <laughs> Uh, yeah, exactly. I know that's super weird, but very bad. Like he could have thought of a better thing than that, surely. Maybe it's the right to a deadline. But um, the uh, the other thing is the conspiracies, right? Yeah. Like all you have all these groups that are using these advanced conditioning techniques, these kind of mental techniques of control, which are a response to the fact that humans have to have a galactic civilization but can't use computers, so they have to evolve themselves. You know, uh, like. Just as the Fremen develop within the harsh conditions of the desert, humans have had to develop uh, these new skills in order to survive in a galactic civilization. But then behind this is the whole conspiracy thing, and the fact that behind all the scene, behind the scenes, you have the the Emperor and the Harkonnens plotting to overthrow, uh, you know, take down the Atreides. You have the Bene Gesserits and their breeding program and their desire to like use eugenics to build this superhuman with uh, uh, who, who can access their like genetic memories and who could be pressing of the future. You have the whole fabrication of the, the, the savior mythology on Dune, which is implanted there um, as a political project by the Bene Gesserit who are kind of like, you know, a, a, a monastic order of, of women, you know, like a, a, with, with these special powers. So it's not simply the interest in kind of superpowers. It is the fact that these powers are presented as A, not magical, but a product of special kinds of training and conditioning with the use of drugs as well. Again, like a big thing and things. And then there's like, the endless conspiracies that are manipulating the masses uh, during this uh, uh, during this period. So it feels very sixties in that sense. And Paul's in a very interesting position because he's kind of he's aware of some conspiracies and going along with some conspiracies, a member of some conspiracies, but he's also kind of being conspired with. Like he's an object and a subject of these conspiracies. Mm -hmm. 
Well, um, I just uh, uh, my contribution will be to be to talk about uh, the the larger milieu all the time. It, I'm just reminded of uh, Robert Heinlein's books, where mm -hmm. like uh, uh, Stranger in a Strange Land, and uh, there's a short story I really like by his bootstraps, and it's constantly. You know, conspiracies are, are are big in Heinlein. Mental powers are big in Heinlein. I do think, and that and Stranger in Strange Land came out in the '60s. I do think that you're right, Stefan, that this was kind of a re reaction to the feeling um, in the culture, not like even necessarily just on the left or something like that, but the feeling yeah. in the culture that that uh, that the the world was being run in ways that didn't make sense, and there were things were going on in the shadows and. And also, we had potential, uh, you know, to go well beyond where we were at. That normal, uh, you know, square society had to be overturned, so that we could break free and develop new ways. Holding you back, holding holding you yeah. back from having yeah. mentat powers. You know, the idea that we only use ten percent of our brain or something was probably yeah, yeah. very popular back uh, around that time. And so, if we could just like get out of the suburbs take the right amount of acid uh you know and and uh, then commune with nature we would develop into superior beings but 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 we would be stopped by the conformist cia and the men working in the shadows i mean it's very interesting that in this in like 40k and i think it's it's very a frequent thing in lots of sci-fi that kind of for whatever reason computers are banned or like ai is banned mm -hmm. And I'm sure Nick Land would have a lot to say about it in terms of like AI is this kind of thing which we can't like get our heads around. It will completely change utterly everything. And so in our sci-fi, we're kind of scared to kind of go and say, oh, yeah, there will be AI. We have to find some contrived manner to ban it so that we can tell these feudalistic noble stories over and over again instead of one that would really imagine the future. That is my science fiction novel about an AI who creates socialism. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I am, I guess, on the side of Nick Land. And, uh, <laughs> but um, I don't care anymore. I, I can say whatever I want now. What, what, <laughs> I mean, there's stuff like, I mean, you do have uh, the culture series, for example, where you have this, like, hyper, like... Yeah, super, that's the only one that I think really properly accepts it. And that accepts it by and all but that means that kind of basically all the culture stories are extraneous to the culture they're all the stories about kind of a person leaving the culture and interacting with someone else from outside the culture because inside the culture there's kind of no more stories right mm -hmm. no more interesting stories anyway because it's all kind of they live in communism uh, with ai and whatever can have whatever they want and all the kind of stories they have are, are personal dramas so all nearly all the culture groups are set with like a person coming into the culture, a person going out to the culture, and blah blah blah, you know, and kind of the, inter the the stuff on the fringe, but kind of an internal story. You can't tell a June story inside the culture because the the, the there's just aren't the circumstances for it. I think that's kind of the reality. Of, I mean, that's hopefully how the future will be. Our lives will be in this way boring, and rather, what we'll do in the future in communism will tell us tell each other interesting stories instead of having to live them. Ah, uh, I don't know. I don't. I don't agree with that about communism. I think the difference will be, where when we are in a story and in a conflict, uh, within our culture, we'll know it as our own and rather than as an alien force, and we'll have more responsibility for problems that arise under communism than we feel we do now. And this idea of a utopian, uh, blank, you know, conflict-free future uh, is is what we what props up the continuation of, of uh, ca capitalism being alien to us, like the, the system really running in ways that we don't have direct responsibility for. Um, that would be my, my well, it, an interesting. I'm, I'm a real history ender, but I know people disagree. Uh, <laughs> an interesting side note is that Rick Priestley, the guy who invented the game 40 K, uh, which was basically just ripped off Dune invent he, he has a new company now called warlord games he made a new sci-fi game which is basically just ripped off the ripped off the um uh, cul uh the culture novels oh, really? yeah and it's uh, and basically it's all about them fighting on the edges of civilization with un 
you know, like with uh, uncivilized uh, uh, humans. But I think, uh, I mean, to, to go back to the kind of commun- conflict and communist uh, question, I think it's going to depend. Like, I've often tried to comprehend, like, how would you write a novel about a communist future? Like, the 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 I guess like the best novel in that sense is probably the dispossessed, but that's all about the guy going from the communist place to the capitalist world and not kind of getting what's going on uh, in in the capitalist world. And then you have the culture where, like you say, that you know, like nothing's really happening in the culture. It's just all the things that are on the edge of the culture and people leaving, you know, going on the peripheries of civilization to meet with like the the savages but you know I mean, when i imagine like communist stories or stories of the world of communism i imagine like the matrix and like jacking in and kind of the boundaries between like the boring communist world that you normally live in and then kind of jacking in to like imagining the past or possible futures or or fantasy worlds and kind of the blurring and weird stuff going on there and then kind of breaking whatever rules they might have about this like, could you imagine if if you're in the communist world and you have the matrix and whatever, you wouldn't, it would be like illegal probably to create kind of clever AI to live in your world that would suffer. But oh. that would be a really cool and fun thing to do, right? Because you don't want to make dumber AI, you want to make clever AI to react to you properly. But, you know, you wouldn't be allowed to torture them or hurt them or not torture them, but you know what I mean? You wouldn't be allowed to make them live a life like we live, which even though you know, I quite like my life. I think to a person living in the future it would have like far too much like illegal suffering in it. I um had once had an idea for a communist novel, like a society, a, a, a novel that took place in a communist society, and uh, my vision was one where everyone in society was a- an atheist, everyone in society was rational, uh, no one ever told a lie, uh, things worked harmoniously. Um, but the main character would be was going to be based on Andy Kaufman, and he was going to claim to be a magician and do really really lame magic tricks like that anyone could see through, and like, and he was you know going to be persecuted and thrown in jail and. Thrown <laughs> in jail. They didn't just ignore yeah, him. Yeah. yeah, no, they couldn't ignore him because he was he was introducing the concept of of uh, uh, deceit back into. Mm-hmm the the culture and and it was seductively you know seductive about it he was people enjoyed him there was something but surprising. that's the thing with real communism is that it couldn't be like ideologically disestablished like merely introducing ideas into it couldn't get rid of it right yeah yeah well it's just it's it's a story you know and, and I didn't even write it but yeah no, you're right. not lost <laughs> <enough>. <laughs> I mean, my, my my idea for conflict in a communist society come from the Mars trilogy. Like you could have a communist society, for example, on Mars, but then a real conflict between those who want to terraform the planet and those who don't want to terraform the planet. And uh, that's not necessarily related to the you know relations of production, but a real ideological kind of conflict over like what would the future be of uh, uh, of the planet. So I think you could have you could have like conflicts within a within a communist society. But they would be about, let's just things that are not necessarily to do with the relations of production, and right. something like terraforming could be a re- you know like a real concrete uh, uh, source of like violent conflict. So I think have been talking about um, seeding. Mm-hmm. Um, like the idea, it's quite hard to get spaceships with humans in them that are kind of like stay alive at the end to stars, even like at relativistic speeds. Um, I know also especially to slow down at the end. There's like quite, there's ways you can kind of go very, very fast uh, and, live, and at the end you can't really slow down. Well, you don't squish, you just don't stop. There's no way to stop. There's no like uh, friction. Obviously, yeah, that's the one thing you can stop on, just stop on a planet, but then everything explodes. But one thing that would be a lot easier would be for us to fire either like kind of uh, extremophile bacteria or just like kind of the building blocks for life onto other planets that we can scan and see that they probably almost certainly don't have any indigenous life. Gotcha. Um, like checking out the swimming pool. Yeah, yeah, and whether that would be ethical and so on. Yeah, I mean, exactly. You could, you can find, I think for, for uh, you know, like for, if you wanted to write a communist future, 
conflict. I think it would be doable, but I think it, I think we're so embedded in our like notions of like conflict in our society is driven by economics, right? Yeah. And it's really driven by the relations of production, which means it's hard for us to imagine conflicts uh, that are not in some way tied to the relations of production. But I think, I think the best best way to do communism is not to try to be almost like the most plausible, but to try and just write something really alien. Because I think if that's one thing that, I think that was kind of what Marx was saying, that his refusal to describe communism was not just his lack of predictive power. It'll just be really weird. It'll be really, really different and weird and strange. I mean, obviously, we have that now where kind of like really old people of the world is alien to them now. It'll be that, but like, way worse way yeah worse. Like, it's like how doug doesn't understand how twitter works or like i know how it works you hit the tweet button <laughs> you say you're right you're right dear, whatever the you had yeah you, you you dear twitter i am uh old. I'm very, I, I'm old. Doug, Doug. Tweet. <laughs> okay but let, let's let's return a little bit back to uh, uh back to june so Let's talk about Dune and the left. Like Frank Herbert was a Republican, right? But he probably wouldn't. He wasn't like the type of Republican we know and love today. He was, he was this kind of libertarian Republican with some left impulses, but like a deep suspicion of the New Deal uh, constellation of political forces. A, a big a big critique of what we might call the professional managerial class today, you know, like Dune comes off in some places, you know, really critiquing liberals and the, the, the professional managerial class who try to control everything. Uh, it comes off to me more like kind of a person you'll see in like British right culture, like um, Christopher Hitchens' brother. Oh, Peter, Peter Hitchens. Hitchens. Yeah. So like, like a Doom guy. Like a guy who's right wing, but thinks they're like totally owned and gonna lose, and has has these kind of like concerns. Well, I think the American right is kind of far too like vitalistic and like victor uh, victorious for for Herbert Dune. <laughs> for Herbert Dune, it's such a good name. Herbert, Herbert Dune is yeah, it's gonna be my new DJ name. Herbert so Dune. um, <laughs> so there's a lot of whinging. Like, I've seen people complain about this. Uh, I want your thoughts. I personally think the critiques of Dune that it's A, Orientalist, and B, that Paul Atreides is a white savior, I think those are like, they're not entirely illegitimate, but they're the laziest critiques that are out there. Like, they're very lazy. Well, it's this, this very unimpressive thing that people do where they kind of like read what's directly written in the text and then kind of show it up as if it's kind of some grand revelation that they themselves exposed. Like, yeah, he's he is like kind of a white savior as part of this like conspiracy by an empire. Like it's not that the American empire is using June as a propaganda tool to trick you into thinking white people are cool. Or if it is, it's that's also what's happening in the book, you know, like you're not kind of revealing something on top of what's written in the book. You're just stating what's written in the book when you say that. Yeah, exactly. It's like, oh, he uses Arabic terminology. Okay. The question is like, is that inherently Orientalist if a white person does that? I mean, like, uh, the question is about the stereotypes and things like that. But, it, but again, as you point out, it isn't even that Paul Atreides is, is like supposed to be this fucking white savior. It is that the Empire has, you know, uh, and the Bene Gesserit, all these forces have manipulated uh, uh, people uh, into preparing them to accept this uh, uh, savior. So it's kind of a subversion of the traditional white savior um, narrative that we see in a lot of, uh, you know, in, in, in novels. Like, it's a thing, It's, but I think it's a little bit lazy to, you know, just dismiss uh, I mean, I think like the whole Orientalist discourse is actually, frankly, a bit toxic these days. Not that there aren't important insights, but it, it, it actually obscures the problematic things that are in Dune, right? Like the the, the political notion uh, that, like the worldview that Dune is espousing is not necessarily problematic because, um, you know, Herbert Dune uses... Um, 
Arabic terminology, right? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I wrote my notes that kind of Paul being white is kind of the least of the problems for Paul Disseldune, right? Yeah, it's like it's like it's the, the eugenics is kind of a bit problematic. Uh, well, it, it's just kind of like a feudalistic conflict. It's like, why should I care about either side? Okay, like that, the Fremen, the, that, like that was the how I thought. Change the planet, but that's really cool. But otherwise, I don't care. Like, yeah, I didn't say like... you're evil, but the Duke, the Atreides, you're still feudal overlords. Like, fuck you. Yeah, exactly. that's how I felt about the whole thing. That was that's my that was my problem getting into the movie from the start. It's like, oh, I'm supposed to identify with which group of autocrats and you know monarchs i i who do, why should i care about any of these people i don't uh uh and you know i couldn't i wanted to identify and like uh the guy who kind of looked like marlon brando but he was too freaky it didn't uh, to to, well, to even identify with him because i knew i knew who that was i knew marlon, i've seen marlon brando before I, I i recognized it i was not lost it wasn't like twitter when I saw him, I recognized like, him. Like, I remember this from the 70s. <laughs> but, but, well, the, I mean, also, it's, there's, there's a kind of social Darwinistic uh, Elan to, to the whole Gene series in mm -hmm. that, you know, you have to, like, you have to you have to beat down the people to teach them a lesson so that they, they, they explode in kind of vitality, right? That right. is the problematic dynamic, that it has this social Darwinistic... Uh, uh, aspect to it uh and i mean the, the left at the moment loves disaster politics from huh? kind of like climate change to lockdowns i think all these disasters are going to lead to like sick stuff happening we've we've yeah. been that we've been I, feeling that way for at least a decade you know the the left has wanted um longer probably heck probably 40 years the the left has looked forward to collapse as a way to get to socialism since at least the 70s um and and you can find old pamphlets you know about that kind of end up uh, advocating for survivalism and things like you know go underground get your canned goods and you know guns uh to to so that we can have socialism our new yeah. society um uh, so yeah I, why, why is it that why are so many people so obsessed with trying to evaluate a movie to see if it's ideologically pure like how if there was such a movie where everything was fine no problems what would that do for us i mean i, I was i guess i was kind of stupid to not see it coming but i've decided to become like a fan of the upcoming wheel of time tv show okay because uh, i'm a massive massive enormous maximal fan of the books and I f didn't realize that kind of being a fan of an American TV show meant involvement with kind of all kind of American politi pseudo political like psychodramas. Mm -hmm. Like the, the the Wheel of Time fandom is currently completely riven and fighting enormously over kind of like gender issues and transgender people and stuff. And it's like <laughs> before the show comes out. And they're fighting over whether the show, including transgender people, will destroy the show or make it amazing. And there's no evidence concretely that the show will have any transgender people in it. It's just and insane. This is this is uh, this is a lot of the problem with um, like the way, I, I, and it's a dialectic because you know now that you have Twitter, you have this social media. These people in the studios. And you spoke about this with Jared about, you know, like there's this desire to have this avant-garde uh, id poll to like demonstrate your bona fides. And sometimes it comes off like as very clumsy and very like, uh, and people react against it. And some people are reacting because they're just like bigots and they don't like, they're like, oh, it's a black woman. I don't like to see a black woman. But some people are like, bro it's like you've written the characters really badly like uh and then they are critiqued saying oh but you just don't like it because you're sexist right it's like with the new star trek right i don't really care that they have like a, a black lady as the main character and things like that and there are some good episodes but like there's like poor writing in it right you know like for example, everyone's crying every week. I don't mind a bit of crying, but if everyone's crying every week, the emotional impact of people crying is like reduced over time. 
so it's like very hard to like have a critique uh because everything is being fought over in a symbolic way and we aren't actually discussing the art in terms of like is it good is it bad you know like why my, might we why my problem, I'll my tell problem you with discovery it, can i can i take some, some say something about discovery yeah. uh the new star trek which is no longer new but my problem with discovery was not that they had uh, a black leading uh character a black woman that was fine whatever my problem was that she didn't she had to become a criminal and uh, completely leave the system yeah she made it all, she, they made it all grim dark they made it all grim dark but, but it's like the, the whole point of the original star trek was that there was hope for the collective of humanity in a in a new in a future where it wouldn't be the kind of perfect utopia although people uh, when when they're making like the next generation worried that gene roddenberry's vision was too utopian and it was impossible to make plots around this right but but yeah the idea was you could have a series of stories about the an optimistic future for the the entirety of the human race and and instead uh this vision was one in which uh the collective social project of of the of humanity is corrupt and yeah. it's only the renegade um you know rebel who's willing to mutiny in the first but not why because her captain overrode her in the chain of command and decided not to do what she told her to do mm -hmm. so she you know that was my problem and it goes on from there like every single expression of authority in star trek uh, discovery is always found to be corrupt now admittedly in the original series anyone other than captain kirk like anyone above him was always turned out to be some pansy and needed to be <laughs> that's yeah, yeah, but the difference right. between like an ineffectual coward and kind of like people that are actively bad like the whole right being... right well, right this right why, this is why lower decks is the best of the new star treks have you have any of you seen lower decks? i haven't seen it i haven't seen it that's the best only, part. only heard that the first season was like intensely soy but then it got better it, it's it, it gets it's it gets better about halfway through the second season but it's like kind of light-hearted and it is a utopia and it also it confirmed uh, uh you know it's you know it's it doesn't take itself super seriously which um you know discovery is way too like the, the lens flare and a very serious storyline it just it just um but the entire discussion instead of revolving around the merits of that show revolve around these symbolic issues which are actually nothing to do with the quality of the show which is like a whole bunch of people crying that like they made it's all gone woke the problem isn't that it's gone woke star trek has always been inverted commas woke right yeah. to a certain degree they had interracial kissing you know like obviously kirk was a kind of uh you know he was still like a very stereotypical alpha male kind of um character but for its for its time it was a pretty progressive tv show uh, next generation also a pretty pr progressive uh t tv show and I think we've come to like, I think it comes down to kind of capitalist realism to a certain extent. Like everything today is so freaking Debbie Downer. Right? I think the, the, the sci-fi of our era, the best like sci-fi that reflects our existing conditions is The Expanse. And I've read the books yeah. and the, 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 the TV series. But The Expanse is like the ultimate capitalist realism, where it's like we all live in the capitalist future. There's a conflict between the colonized and the 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 colonizers but there are good people you know with some good liberal elites you can solve the problems right i and may end up bleeping out capitalist realism down by the cruel speed of light too right there's no ftl there's no ftl there's no ftl exactly they have they have the they have like a fast thing they can fly around the solar system but it really is like and the spoilers for people who haven't read the novels when you get to the end of the second trilogy, their solution is basically uh, all the major powers come together and have like an elite level compromise in which like they won't treat the, 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 the where they'll give, they'll give the space people, what the, the, the belters, you know, the people who live in, in, in space and who are oppressed, they'll give them like control of like space trade, right? And they yeah. will have that role within the overall like uh economic structure of, they get their casinos 
Yeah, they, they yeah they get yeah they get they get yeah they get freaking space casinos. That's what they do. They're like, we're not going to murder you anymore. We're going to give you a cut of the capitalist pie, and we're going to continue uh, capitalist exploitation through the ring gates to all the other things. Now, I think like Expanse is really a compelling story, and the writing is really good. But I think yeah, it's like ultimately a uh, a very much you know capitalism is cannot even be challenged so to talk about june again this, this oh, idea june. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's this big thing in, in june as we've, we've talked about quite a bit already of um kind of neo-feudalism going hand in hand with, with transhumanism as in by the kind of technical innovation the stuff of drugs and mental conditioning the nobility of june uh managed to make themselves qualitatively better than the people around them and it's very interesting i don't know if you guys pay much attention to this but especially in um, like california i forget, forget what this valley is called it shows i'm not american uh but you know this this tech valley where all the Sil tech people Sil Sil silicon valley uh, silicon valley um they have all these kind of websites and reddits and whatever which mm -hmm. are all kind of about trying to take drugs to basically become mentats you know and all these kind of different ideas of like biohacking Right. Uh, there are weird ideas that you can like sleep just like two or four hours a day if you do segmented sleep. Um, and they're, you know, they're taking drugs and they're doing bio stuff and they're trying to like, they're starting to use these, even though it's very in its infancy for us, they're very enthusiastic about kind of like, uh, like exoskeleton suits and mechanical innovations. And it does seem that definitely our ruling class, as much as the junior ruling class is, is fascinated by this idea of making themselves actually qualitatively superior to the rest of us. Well, I, think, I agree. I mean, I think that's definitely a big trend, especially amongst the libertarian right. Like this, uh, and you know, I was, you know, when I was at university, I was at an elite school, like this culture of study drugs and all these kind of things, like this was like a real thing. Uh, that existed. People are looking for ways to find a competitive edge. And I think... Yeah, but know, right there, I want to jump in and say, as soon as you're talking about improving yourself in order to compete more eff efficiently and effectively, you're not really buying into an aristocratic vision. Right? You're being... Everything's being mediated through competition on the market and, and, and for capital. But, you know, you, you can have, like, you don't have to have, like, a European feudalism. You can have, like, a Chinese feudalism. But they had, like, you know, they had exams. And they had this competition. They had this quantitative system. Um, but, it mm -hmm. like, I don't think, like, obviously the bourgeoisie and kind of quantification and numbers and stuff have become associated and, and competition. But I don't think these two are, like, a necessary link, and especially in our version of capitalism. Hmm. And I think also it depends on one's position within uh, sort of the hierarchy of society. When you look at these like millionaires and billionaires uh, who are involved, you know, who are who have made it, they, you know, they do have a, like a kind of semi-feudalistic uh, way of looking at things, the desire to like extend their lives or go and fucking move to Mars and start a, a new superior uh, civilization. I think. I think it's kind of it's kind of an interesting tendency that people are looking at ways of, you know, distinguishing themselves from the great unwashed, in a biological sense. You know, in the past, people did it through clothing and like some tree laws, forbidding people to wear certain items and things, through their houses and things. I think with biological technology and and uh, you know cyber technology, I think. People are increasingly looking to find like ways to build their bodies and minds to in ways that previously didn't exist. I think that's a that's like a real tendency among certain elements of the like technologically inclined ruling classes. They're still really bad at it though. They all suck and they're ugly and stupid. <laughs> they, that's true. And they don't uh, have any interesting ideas. Like Elon Musk occasionally has interesting ideas about what you should do with his money, but like uh, Amazon guy, it's like okay, I'll do like a bit of space stuff, and then otherwise I'm just gonna fucking waste all my money on like a bigger yacht. Wow. Well, uh, um, the Google people are investing in uh, 
lo- longevity research, you know, the life experience. Yeah, that was, was going to be another thing I mentioned. They also have, I think at Google, they have this thing which can like, they do like direct electrical impulses to certain parts of your brain. And it, it's for, like it's for, it does all kind of weird mental stuff to you. It's not about improving, it's about like helping with disabilities. But I guess the point is eventually it'll be able to like upgrade a baseline human too. I, I feel as though socialists should not reject out of hand the idea of life extension or or, or any of these texts to improve. No, obviously, I think they're great. Yeah. I, yeah. I just don't want them to be owned by a few. Yeah, yeah and, and, right, and exactly. they're, all, they're also great, and I don't think they also should be a priority. Like, my position is, like, all these technological innovations are fine, uh, and, like, I don't have any problem. The question is always, as Stefan and you said, is, like, who controls them, who has access to them? But the primary task of socialists should be to, you know, redistribute the resources that exist now. Capitalism, like, you could stop medical innovation tomorrow, you know, stop it for 10 years, and then just purely concentrate on ensuring that people have access to the medical technologies that we have existing today. And you could probably do a far more, you could probably help far more people than like coming up with a, coming up with some kind of like migraine tablet that works 20 minutes faster than uh, the, than the previous one. The, you know, capitalism is, you know, when Marx was writing, capitalism had not really yet created the conditions of abundance needed to like, give everybody the good life but today you know even in the field of medical technology if we if everybody had access to the top level medical care that uh, the wealthy in the world have today and if that was our entire focus as a socialist regime to spread the existing technology that would do far more good than than investing in dealing with uh let's say like rich people rich old people diseases like getting kids yeah, i mean like the british royal family has like a life expectancy of like 95 on average right right if we could get high. like the, the queen mother was like a gin soaked person for her whole life and she died at like 94. yeah but every once in a while you the, the royal family dies in a car crash remember <laughs> <laughs> uh, she wasn't real she wasn't really in it that's why she died in a car crash. it wasn't she a car crash she was twice. she would have seen it coming yeah, right. By the way, the, 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 <laughs> the Queen Mother died, and you know how old she was? 100? 102. 102. And she was like an alcoholic. She was an alcohol, a functional alcoholic. She had like a drinks plan. She like drank, she had a drink before breakfast. And obviously That's for her, breakfast was probably like 5.59 in the morning. So yeah, we need to, we need to be focusing on that. I think... Uh, so wait, is this healthy? Is this what I'm hearing? That if I have a drink before <laughs> breakfast, I'll live to 102? That's not that right if to you, me. If you Google it, there's like a, a queen queen mother like drinking plan she had, and you can follow it. And, you know, see how you and end up, mate. You, you lose weight and you gain a crown. Is that what happens when you? <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, she was never the queen. Like, we need well, to... she was the queen, but not the ruling queen or whatever. Well, we need the uh, we need the um, we need we all need the geriatric spice. You know, to help us see the historical dialectic. I think I came up with the best description of Dune. Rich kid, rich kid Paul Atreides goes to Arrakis on his gap year, takes a load of drugs, sees the historical dialectic, gets black pills, and then I guess what the afterwards is like he ends up, you know, going on a rampage, you know? Joining ISIS. Joining ISIS, yeah, he ends up joining ISIS and uh, doing a full-on. Uh... It's interesting in the book that he he knows he's going to be like the leader of a jihad, and he's trying to avoid it. But it makes clear that kind of like leaders aren't in charge, in kind of like a sense they don't have total freedom of action, mm-hmm. right? That's he's a good idea because he does the right things, the correct things, and if he didn't do the correct things, he wouldn't be in charge. And so he's free to be in power and control as long as he does these things. But he doesn't have just total freedom of action. I think I, yeah, I think that's a really I think that's a really good part of the Dune novel as well because I think, and, and I'll bring this to Game of Thrones. Like Game of Thrones was popular, I think, at the beginning because it was a type of TV series that people hadn't really seen, where you had people who were doing things 
like which they may not have wanted to do but their position and their uh, within the social structure and society forced them to make particular decisions that they did so it wasn't a, and and the reason it went crappy was that they flipped and it turned into a psychodrama right it turned into like you know how does Daenerys feel but you know what 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 is interesting about dune and what i think was powerful about game of thrones was i think this like understated but very real sense that you are to us you you don't have freedom of action even when you're at the top of society you are shaped by social forces that are beyond your power to control paul trades he has prescience he can see all the to- futures and things like this and he still doesn't know really what to do because it's like there's a lot of decisions and they they all end up terrible uh so i think i think the kind of weight of social forces on people made june very powerful and and i think that well, was it's, it's made completely explicit at the start of the movie in the start of the book that's not a psychodrama when gurney halleck comes in and he's like you know i'm not really in the mood just bold fighting and gurney halleck's like oh you know it doesn't matter about mood mood is irrelevant in your yeah. life and the life you live your mood is irrelevant you do what you do you do what you have to do yeah and i think that's i think that's one of the best lessons you can get out of dune as well because uh so much of uh the way that americans view politics is through the realm of psychodrama right you know like if you look at the way that americans commentate about kirsten cinema right and the fact that she's holding up it's like kirsten cinema what's her psychodrama she has some psychodrama for sure but she's but a fascinating person but that's obviously irrelevant that's irrelevant because she's she's in a position that she's been she has perhaps some freedom of action right yeah. but she's in a position that like at the end of the day limits her freedom of action you know people kind of understand this ironically with joe mansion like oh joe mansion is just a corrupt you know west uh west virginia like coal yeah. baron so he's going to do what a west virginia but people like you know kirsten cinema I, like, I think it's because mansion's like an unrelatable guy well, we all know a Kirsten cinema. We all know. Well, do, can I can I can I tell you, tell you something personal just happened uh, to me while you guys were talking? Go just ahead. Got, just got dumped via text. <laughs> <laughs> Did you get dumped? Yeah. Well, I mean, I dated her twice. It's no big deal. It's the app world. But she's like, well, we were gonna get together next week, but I'm I met someone and now where I'm seeing him exclusively, and so. No, so Doug, does, Doug doesn't have freedom of action. <laughs> Doug, doesn't have freedom of, Doug doesn't have freedom of action. But this this is how it ha- you know this is how it goes when you're out there playing the app game. In the meat oh. market, my man, and he's put the no, D- DFW got dumped in the June podcast. Yeah, <laughs> Sorry, was that comprehensible? Should I speak no, that, that's but that's that's that, I understood what you mean. So uh, yeah, the feeling when you get dumped during the June podcast. During the June cut. <laughs> hey, listen, guys, do we? I, I want to uh, I want to wrap this up not because I got dumped and I need to go cry <laughs> I swear to God, but <laughs> but but because I I want to I want to wrap it up. But can we uh, can we do this uh, again? Like you guys want to make a culture show every week and we can pick out something that we are well, every do, couple. Let's weeks? do Wheel of Time next. Do we do want to do Wheel of Time? Uh, okay. Can I? What do I do? Watch the first couple episodes, or is it out already? Or or it comes out seventeenth, I think. Okay. Book, so then why don't we why don't we do something else in between and then do wheel of time so we'll all have time to watch the first episode and because in a week it's uh that's the 12th that will be too soon but do you want to record something next friday I mean, jen was imagining it being monthly but i mean obviously i have infinite free time because you're unemployed and i'm a grad student but jen's right. obviously a professor and a dad well you're a dad too but he's a new dad there will be a new dad i can always so I, put time, I can always put time away uh, look look and if if it turns out you can't make it we can we can you guys can do it yourself. yeah but, uh, why don't we why don't we i mean you're going to edit this right doug yeah i'll just chop oh. off this part i'll sure. leave in the part where i get dumped i think that a, a yeah, yeah. Of, you know it's very relatable <laughs> um, i think tfw get dumb june june podcast has to be it uh, <laughs> that's a, that should be the uh that should be the title